traditionally, Christians believed that Christians are now the chosen people, right? The, mm -hmm. the Jews are no longer the chosen people. Uh, for Christians to support the building of a third temple is absolutely blasphemous because in the New Testament, Jesus is clearly described as being the new temple, the, the final temple. In, in Romans 6 and in Hebrews 10, you know, Paul says that Jesus was the the be-all, end-all sacrifice. He's the ultimate temple. He's the ultimate high priest, the ultimate sacrifice. And yet Christian Zionists, they fully support the third temple where sin yeah. sacrifices will apparently return one day according to Jewish messianism. Uh, so Christian Zionism is, is, is just indefensible from a biblical perspective. So what actually happened here? Um, how did Zionism become so popular among American Protestants? Well, in 1831, there was this Anglican preacher uh, named John Nelson Darby. Okay. Mm. And so he was one of the primary organizers of a non-denominational Christian movement called the Plymouth Brethren. So, so you know, this is what happens when church tradition uh, is ignored. So, so Darby is considered to be the father of something called modern dispensationalism. Okay, so what is, what is modern dispensationalism? So this is basically, uh, it's this notion that there will be a future restoration of the earthly nation of Israel. But this also includes this idea that the Mosaic Covenant and the Christic Covenant are two valid coexisting covenants. They're both valid, mm. okay? Uh, 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 this is also known as dual covenant theology. In other words, Christians do not need to convert Jews. Mm -hmm. The Jews already have a valid covenant. Jews are still chosen by God, irrespective of their belief in Jesus, okay? So if, if we just think about the theological implications of this for Christianity, I mean, this implies that Christ only came for the Gentiles, mm. not the Jews. That's the implication that it actually directly contradicts the New Testament Jesus. Uh, you know, when he said, I was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, mm. right? So, you know, instead of, you know, for God so loved the world, it, it, he should have said for God so loved the Gentiles mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son because the Jews don't need him. At yeah. least not yet. So, so according to Darby, let's get into his eschatology then, hmm. that Christ will rule the reconstituted uh, physical ethnic Jewish state of Israel. So national Israel will be restored, according to Darby. According to Darby, the Old Testament prophesizes not so much the church age, but really the kingdom, the millennium, where Christ rules the national Jewish state of Israel. And Darby was also a dual covenant dispensationalist. So what does that mean? Again, this means that the Mosaic covenant and the Christic covenant are two valid coexisting covenants. They're both valid. So when Jesus returns to rule over national Israel, all of Israel will eventually believe in him. Mm. Right? And there's going to be a reversal. He came the first time, they almost all rejected him. When he comes the second time, they will all believe in him. Okay. Now, now, Darby was famous for saying that the Bible must be rightly divided. This is a very famous phrase from Darby. He actually takes it from the letters of Paul, but Paul uses it in a different way. The Bible must be rightly divided. What he meant was that much of the New Testament does not actually apply to Christians, but only to Jews. Mm. That, that Jesus primarily in the synoptic gospel, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's actually teaching the Mosaic covenant, okay? But in John's gospel, as well as through Paul's writings, Jesus was advancing the Christian covenant. So there's almost like two gospels. Mm. So according, according to Darby, Jesus was teaching both dispensations, okay? Both, both covenants are valid side mm. by side. Now, Darby's dispensationalism uh, eventually found its way across the pond uh, to America. So Pastor James Hall Brooks, he kind of just fell in love with Darby um, with his teachings, right? Don't get the wrong idea. Um, and then Brooks, he, he was in St. Louis, and there was an annual Bible conference called the Niagara Bible Conference. And Brooks was often the keynote speaker. So it was at this conference when Darbyan uh, dispensationalism uh, became more and more popular via James Brooks. And Brooks had a preacher friend named Dwight Moody. Uh, and Moody would later establish the famous Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, where Bible is their middle name, as Bart Ehrman always says. Mm. Uh, and then Moody also became a Darbyan dispensationalist. 
And then Moody befriended a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. Okay. Now, Schofield was a morally questionable lawyer and politician. He was accused of multiple charges of theft, uh, bribery, forgery. He was a deadbeat husband and father, a self-described alcoholic uh, turned Christian minister. So he became an ordained pastor in Dallas in 1883, hmm. Schofield. In 1888, he wrote a treatise called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, Rightly hmm. Dividing the Word of Truth. So he started calling himself uh, C.I. Schofield D.D., that is Doctor of Divinity, although there's okay. no record of him ever graduating <laughs> hmm. from seminary. So it seemed like he gave himself kind of an honorary <laughs> doctorate, kind of like what Dartmouth College did for Dr. Seuss. Right? <laughs> Honorary doctorate. Dr. Seuss wasn't a real doctor. C.I. Schofield was not a real doctor. Hmm. In 1909, Schofield wrote his Schofield Study Bible. This was published by Oxford. Hmm. So this Bible, the Schofield Study Bible, had a massive, massive impact on American Protestants and evangelicals. It is no exaggeration that this Bible turned millions of American Protestants into Christian Zionists. I mean, it changed a generation of preachers. His, his Bible translation is essentially the King James translation, but he added all of these strange notes in his commentary. <clears throat> so in his commentary of Genesis 12, 3, okay, so this is the most infamous one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is God's promise to Abraham. Okay, so Schofield's commentary, it changed the game. So basically God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So here's what Schofield wrote, right? He said, and curse those who curse you, wonderfully fulfilled in the history of the dispersion. It has invariably fared ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew. Mm. Well with those who have protected him, the future will still more remarkably prove this principle. Mm. Right. So, so, so basically Schofield is applying this verse to ethnic Jews, uh, contemporary ethnic Jews that this, that the Jews are still chosen, that anyone who curses Jews have, in, uh, will be cursed by God. And so after Schofield, it became ubiquitous among Protestants that Christians owe unconditional, unquestionable loyalty to the Jewish people because mm. they never ceased to be chosen. Okay. Mm. This is Schofield's commentary. And so this doggish Christian loyalty, this, uh, this pathetic, almost slavish mm -hmm. Christian loyalty to ethnic Jews extends to the modern murderous state of Israel because eventually Jesus will rule Israel. That's mm. Jesus's future kingdom. Mm. Right. But as we said, in light of the New Testament, and this is a grave misleading, misreading of Genesis chapter 12, because Paul actually quotes, he actually, Paul has a commentary on Genesis chapter 12. And Paul says that when it says Abraham and his seed, his seed is only Jesus, not the Israelites. Mm. This, is, this is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Mm. He says, if, if you belong to, to Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham. This is a conditional statement in, in Galatians 3. In other words, you have to believe in Jesus or else you're no longer chosen, hmm. right? So according to the New Testament, uh, the church is the new Israel. The church is a new Zion, right? Uh, which does and can include some ethnic Jews as well. But, but belief in Jesus without, is without question. You have to believe in Jesus. According to the New Testament, okay, the Last Supper... Um, the, the, at the Last Supper, the, this is this is when the pronouncement and initiation of the new covenant co covenant uh, occurred. This was on Mount Zion, on Holy Thursday, and then the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost occurred in the same upper room fifty days later on Mount Zion. So both the establishment of the new covenant as well as the proclamation of the new covenant happened on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So you see what the authors of the New Testament are saying. The Christian church is the new Zion. Mm. When Thomas Aquinas wrote his hymns praising Zion, there's a bunch of hymns that Aquinas wrote where he's praising Zion. He's praising the Christian church, mm. not, not some future secular Jewish ethnostate. Yeah. So how, how did Schofield actually do it? So, so in 2005, uh, Joseph Canfield, he wrote a biography about Schofield. 
Uh, it's called the, the Incredible Schofield and his Bible. So mm -hmm. a, according to Canfield, in 1901, Schofield joined an, an exclusive males only secret society called the Lotus Club. Mm. And, and Canfield suggests that someone highly influential within the club, he thinks it was another lawyer named Samuel Untermeyer, uh, basically promoted and financed Schofield's Bible project. In other words, Schofield had powerful American Zionists bankrolling his project. Mm. Schofield was the textbook definition of what's known as a useful idiot, mm -hmm. right? Someone who's used by powerful people to do their bidding without really understanding the consequences of his, mm. of his actions. So in 1948, when you know, Israel became a state, Darby and dispensationalism through Schofield exploded even more mm. in popularity among Western Protestants. So Israel has been restored, you see, just as Darby said. So this further vindicated dispensationalism. And so the Christian Zionists, they were saying, you know, we better be nice to Israel or else God will curse us, according to Genesis you know, 12, 3, we better, we better be nice to Israel because it is Jesus's future kingdom. Mm. Now, one of Schofield's students uh, was named Louis Schaefer. He died in 1952. A and Schaefer founded the Dallas Theological Seminary in 1924. So he was actually the president of, of Dallas Theological Seminary until 1952. A famous alumnus of DTS uh, is a man named Hal Lindsey, and he's still alive. In 1973, uh, Lindsay wrote this book that took the world by storm. Uh, it, it had the power of 30 Harry Potters. Wow. Uh, it was called The Late Great Planet Earth. Mm. Okay, Millions upon millions of copies were sold. I mean, it seemed like everyone in America was reading this book about end times prophecies in the Bible mm. through a lens of Darby and dispensationalism. Mm. It was even made into a film that was narrated by Orson Welles. So H Hal Lindsay, by the way, uh, he said in 1979 that, that Jesus would return in 1988 because there's a verse in Matthew 24 where Jesus, at least the Matthean Jesus, says, this generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. The present generation will live to see it all. So mm -hmm. apparently Jesus was speaking about this restored kingdom. So one generation is 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. In 1948, the restoration of national Israel, uh, also known as the Nakba, plus 40, 1988, right? Mm -hmm. So that never happened. Um, in 1984, uh, Oxford put out the new Schofield uh, study mm -hmm. Bible, okay? Mm -hmm. And they added this clarifying comment. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings mm -hmm. inevitable judgment. Mm -hmm. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable judgment. It's ajib. You know, the new, you know the New Testament Jesus he said that the that the the only unforgivable sin was blasphemy against mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But now in today's you know zeitgeist, we're constantly told that any critique of Zionism uh, is anti-Semitic. Oh, so so anti anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. This is what we're told. Yeah. So then so then Christians who read that note from Schofield uh, must only conclude that anti-Zionism is the unforgivable sin in the sight of God. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism, a form of which is anti-Zionism, brings inevitable judgment, right? And there's a bunch of things that he says. For example, Schofield, in his commentary of Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, this is what he said. He said, the expression, my people, ammi in Hebrew, is used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel. Mm. nation. He's just wrong here. He's demonstrably wrong. I, I, Isaiah 19.25, it says, Baruch Ami Mitzrayim, blessed be Egypt, my people. Ajib. He's just wrong. In his mm. commentary of Genesis, Schofield wrote, quote, the Palestinian covenant gives the conditions under which Israel, he's talking about physical Israel, uh, entered the promised land. It is important to see that the nation has never as yet taken the land under the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, nor has it ever possessed the whole land. This is just wrong. If you read Joshua 21, 43, this is what it says. So the Lord gave Israel all the land, kol ha'eretz, it says in the Hebrew, all the land he had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. So Schofield wants us to think that this is still an outstanding promise 
that mm -hmm. God has not yet fulfilled his side of the deal. Mm -hmm. Right? It's really amazing. And then he says, two dispossessions and restorations have been accomplished. Israel is now in the third dispersion from which she will be restored at the mm. return of the Lord as king. So I think Christians, they need to ask themselves, they need to ask themselves a very important question. Who are you going to believe? Who do you follow, Schofield or Scripture? Yeah. 